New circular on certificates of origin issued in Vietnam. Vietnamese startups to go global. Hello there, you're tuning into another edition of BizLine on VTV International. I'm your host, Hoang Hang, and as Vietnam bids farewell to the Year of the Dog, we will now review some top highlights wrapping up a positive year for economic development in Vietnam. The Ministry of Industry and Trade has issued circular number three stipulating the certificates of origins rule in the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, otherwise known as CPTPP. The circular will take effect from March the 8th this year. Vietnamese goods exported before the effective date of this circular Certificates of origin granting agencies and organizations shall consider granting certificates of origin forms to enjoy tariff preferences under the agreement and regulations of importing member countries. Only when the origin requirements are met can Vietnamese products be exported to new markets to enjoy preferential tariffs. This is a strict rule of origin to prevent countries that are not members of the agreement from taking advantage of tax incentives. Foreign direct investment or FDI pledge to Vietnam witnessed a significant yearly increase of 52% to 1.9 billion US dollars in the first month of this year, the Ministry of Planning and Investment said on Monday. The manufacturing and processing sector retained its crown as the most attractive sector to foreign investors, accounting for 1.19 billion US dollars or 62.4% of total registered capital. The science and technology sector beat the retail sector to rank second with 185.6 million US dollars or 9.7%. Among 51 countries and territories investing in Vietnam, Japan remained the leading investor with nearly 364 million US dollars, followed by the Republic of Korea and China. The food and drinks processing industry has seen growth of 7% in recent years, with more and more foreign investors deciding to pour money into the sector. According to experts, the food and drink sector is now taking the largest proportion of monthly spending for Vietnamese, around 35%. Export turnover for food processing and agricultural products totaled more than 40 billion US dollars last year. Vietnamese products have successfully reached many technical standards and quality barriers and are present in 200 countries including the US, Japan, the Republic of Korea and the EU. For foreign investors, the abundance of agricultural products in the country is an advantage. Vietnam is considered one of the top five food baskets in the world and among the 15 largest agricultural exporters. According to the most recent data published by the General Statistic Office, Vietnam's Consumer Price Index, or CPI, only increased by 0.1% over the previous month and 2.56% over the same period last year. As January is the month right before the Lunar New Year, people's consumption often soars. However, January CPI only increased slightly because abundant supply of goods for date had been well prepared beforehand. Compared to the previous month, 9 among 11 of the main product and service groups increased, with drinks and tobacco increasing the highest. Commercial banks are taking rapid measures to ensure ATM service quality and safety during the Lunar New Year holiday, when there is high demand for cash transactions. In Hanoi, the funding for ATMs makes up 18 million US dollars per day, up from the usual 11 million per day. The demand for cash withdrawal in just a month has reached billions of dollars. Service providers are asked to check their ATM systems to ensure card payments are secured. Attention must be paid to upgrading software and the operation of cameras and maintenance to ensure ATMs are working efficiently. They must also supervise the operation of their ATM networks, especially in industrial parks export processing zones and densely populated areas with high demand for cash to proactively detect and promptly solve any technical problems. 
Deputy Prime Minister Ching Lee Dung just signed a decision to approve a scheme for enhancing air connectivity with tourism markets. The plan is to open new routes, increase the frequency on the existing routes between Vietnam and key tourist markets around the world, including the US, France, England, Japan, South Korea, China, Thailand, Singapore and India and open new domestic routes connecting key tourist areas of the country's northeast region, central Vietnam, south central coast highlands, Mekong Delta and Phu Quoc Pearl Island, contributing to the development of the tourism sector. Those are some economic highlights over the past week. Up next in our crosstalk, we'll discuss the strategies for Vietnamese startups to go global. Stay tuned. Startups have been banded around the increasing frequency over the past few years to describe scrappy young entrepreneurs with critical solutions. But the key attribute of a startup is its ability to grow. Speaking of this, many Vietnamese startups have led the way in going global, yet many of them are experiencing both ups and downs. So what should be the strategies for startups to go global? Are there any common formulas for all the startups to swim overseas? Our crosstalk today will show you more. But first, let's take a look at the following clip. Easy Cloud is the first Vietnamese company to offer hotel management solutions abroad with a presence in five countries around the world. Other Vietnamese startups that have successfully gone overseas include Fasco, Bikitting, Vientrip, Design Bold. These are just some of successful Vietnamese startups who went overseas. According to statistics from the Ministry of Science and Technology, Vietnam has more than 3,000 startups businesses operating, compared to with 1,800 in 2015. Many startups have attracted domestic and foreign investment funds, which is a favorable condition for them to fulfill their ambitions to reach the world. However, coming up with a great business idea is just the beginning. The conquest of foreign markets is not simple, especially under the context that many Vietnamese startups are lack of experience, capital and technology. We have in our studio today the two main guests who will join us in our following talks. First, Bobby Liu, currently the Senior Director of Topica at Tech Group and also co-founder of Topica Founder Institute. And Quân Lê, co-founder and CEO of Binka B, a fintech startup headquartered in Nigeria, London and Hanoi. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you. Now, sing or swim may be the most frequently asked question when it comes to startups. Does it actually mean that startup swims when it uh, successfully go global or attract foreign investors. Uh, Bobby, could you tell us a little bit from your experience? The fundamental explanation of swim and, or sink is survival. Um, and then you become Michael Phelps when <laughs> you're able to go global, right? It's not easy building any kind of business. It's not easy to go alone in doing what you want to do, especially in disruptive spaces. So yeah, it takes a while to, to build the startup to a certain level of scale for acceptance and during that period of time basically if you are still surviving we call it you're still swimming and obviously uh, a lot uh, unfortunately a lot of uh, startups you know uh, do not survive uh, you know initial period two three years a lot of all these startups i think the the good founders right uh, even though they may not uh, survive the first couple years uh, usually uh, a lot of them would come back and do something else later, a second startup or third startup, and eventually they do swim and then become a success. And what about Binkabi Gwen? Um, what are your orientations? Okay, so Binkabi is a startup in financial technology, and we are a platform for issuing, trading, and financing commodities on the blockchain. And at the moment, um, we focus on both domestic and international markets. For domestic markets, our market our first market is not in Vietnam, but actually in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we actually based in London, but work mainly in, in Africa, in countries like Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Kenya, and South Africa. And because of the nature of our business, which is focused on also international trading, we have to go uh, global uh, <laughs> because that, that is part of the, the business itself. 
Now, an argument that actually echoed your opinion, Bobby, that is some um, say that to go global, startup need to go local first. Others think that unlike big corporations, startup can go global and local at the same time. So what are your opinions? It really depends on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know, it's really hard to generalize. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the context of Vietnam, 99% um, of ideas um, are more of local, local adoption. But then there are, you know, great ideas that come out of Vietnam. And, and I think in a generalized sense, for example, right, then I think uh, you have to conquer the local market first, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then think about you know mm -hmm. if if the, the solutions that you have um, are also you know similar solutions to existing problems that mm -hmm. other countries are facing, and if they are and there are no better solutions, for example, then yes, you have an opportunity to to scale out. And in our program at Topka Founder Institute, uh, we also had a startup that uh, pretty much didn't offer a solution that had local adoption, but you know he had great su you know successes. Uh, when he went to Silicon Valley, right? Um, and then, of course, we have uh, then, you know, for Topka, for example, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with a high level of success uh, in Thailand in, when we expanded there about three, four, four years ago. Do you have anything to add to Sure. Bobby? With international trading, uh, you basically have, uh, you know, complexities of involving more than one country, so different legal systems, but also international trade can be very cumbersome. So we actually uh, deliberately also try to sort of um, uh, do well in a local market um, for sort of high volume, low value kind of commodities. And then for international market, we only focus on some very specific commodities like rice and cashew nuts, because those are the ex ex existing flows between Vietnam and Africa, and there's a lot of issues in there. But we are not trying to do every single thing in international trade. To understand more about the Go Global strategies that startups can adopt, we will be speaking with our reporter Dai Chang in the studio today. Hello, Dai Chang. Well, thank you, Hong Hong, for having me. While many uh, startups often ask themselves whether to go global or go global, and I totally agree with Bobby and Quan's viewpoints that startups today need to acquire the domestic market first and they only go overseas when they are big enough. Now, this can be seen through the cases of FPT, Viettel, Ohang, and Zalai, and these are the very prominent examples for this strategy. And uh, going global is different from going local as you need to do lots of researches and um, in terms of market entrance, customer targets and market segmentation. And all of these require the accumulation of experiences and capital. However, startups can skip this step or in other words, go global right in the first phase. And this reminds me of the Flappy Bird app by Nguyen Ha Dong or um, even Bing Kabi of Quan, right? So what about your uh, comments on this strategy, Quan? You're right. So these days, uh, for some kind of startup, uh, especially when it comes to software-based startup, we can actually um, go global. Because it's software-based, it doesn't really matter where you sit. Yes. Uh, it matters where you can actually create a product and that product's being accepted by uh, the markets that you're targeting. So now with the help of angel mm -hmm. investors or venture funds or incubators and also accelerator programs, and uh, their connections also, startups can shorten their time to go overseas. As part of your business have connected you with those stakeholders. So what are your comments? Uh, our program, Topka mm -hmm. Founder Institute, uh, it's, uh, this program is run in six different countries in Southeast Asia, but globally, Mm -hmm. you know, is run in 180 different cities. So it is, uh, you know, truly a global program. And, and, and from a global context, we have uh, more than 9,000 mentors that our graduates can actually tap into. Mm -hmm. uh, in Vietnam, since uh, running it since 2011, uh, I think in Vietnam alone, we have probably more than, I would say, uh, easily 200 mentors mm -hmm. that, you know, the local uh, graduates can actually tap into. Thank you very much for your information. So now for the startups going global, it also means thinking about where you will scale next and how you will scale your business. And I thank you for joining me in our discussion. And uh, the following report will show you how investors and accelerators can help startups in reaching their global dreams. In the last days of 2018, Fasco, a Vietnamese ride-hailing app, launched its first foreign brand in Myanmar and the next destination would be Indonesia. 
this technology startup has received capital from Vina Capital Ventures, a 100 million US dollar venture capital fund aiming at Vietnamese technology startups. Chúng tôi đặt cái mục tiêu là có khoảng 2 triệu người dùng Rồi trong năm tới. Chúng tôi sẽ tiếp tục mở rộng ra các dịch vụ trong cái hệ sinh thái này, nó chỉ vận chuyển. Venture Capital Funds also emphasize that tech startups with innovative ideas, technological intensity and potential to develop overseas are the key factors to consider for investment. We have a strong emphasis on, um, uh, on, on fintech and, uh, and a lot of technologies that are surrounding the consumers, the people in Vietnam. Uh, so, you know, but we, we are at the same time, we are also opportunistic with the, uh, the promising companies. When we see good founders, when we see good companies with good solutions, um, we, we, we will consider to invest as well. Recently, Korea's biggest venture fund, the Korean Venture Investment Corp, or KVIC, confirmed to be the next one to enter the Vietnamese startups market. Through cooperation with the Ministry of Science and Technology, a joint venture fund will be established that help Vietnamese startups to explore the Korean market. Vietnam taro, mo Hanguk taro, mo Silicon Valley taro, ane sijuni isratin asmila. So, hangang katun sijuni tende. Yes, the first year is experience. Adventure investment. We're looking for passionate startups who can finish their services well. Moreover, innovative ideas that can change the world are also an important criteria that we look for. 새로운 인노버티브한 서비스 모델이라든가. Besides venture funds, startups now can receive supports from incubators and also accelerator programs in the country to reach overseas markets. Launched in January 2017 by FPT Ventures and Dragon Capital, Vietnam Innovative Startup Accelerator or Visa has become one of the most prestigious startup accelerators in Vietnam. Chúng tôi đang hoạt động theo mô hình là venture builder, có nghĩa là chúng tôi sẽ cùng đi cùng các cái startup Chúng tôi có những cái chuyên gia hệ thống mạng lưới có thể giúp các startup giảm những cái thời gian ra thị trường nhiều nhất có thể. Đấy, ngoài ra thì chúng tôi đồng sáng lập quỹ Visa là quỹ tăng tốc khởi nghiệp cho các công ty startup tại Việt Nam. Uh, now, Bobby, going overseas means that Vietnamese startup must receive investment fund from venture fund or through M&A. So, do you have any recommendations for startup in such process to have better connection with uh, venture fund and foreign investors? Um, I think investors look for different things. Uh, some investors really do look at you know local domination, especially uh, the bigger brick and mortar business. For startups, yes, there's. I think if you have a great product to solve and great solutions to solve you know, existing problems and these problems uh, are not uh, necessarily solved in the best way outside of Vietnam, for example, then mm -hmm. I think that presents a great opportunity for startups. And when that happens, investors will kind of sniff you out, right? Uh, in the last three, four years, um, we have more and more VCs coming to Vietnam uh, on a regular basis. I remember back in 2013, 2014, uh, mm -hmm. if we ever hosted, you know, three in a year, mm -hmm. then the whole ecosystem would be like really busy, you know. And last week, mon last Monday alone, I hosted five VCs from Korea, mm -hmm. you know, in one day. And in terms of like funding, it's just that, you know, if, if you're growing, they know. And if, if you do, you know, provide a very compelling story in how you are able to expand, then I believe the, the funding will come. I was recently in South Africa yeah. and um, actually one of the government officials there actually cited Vietnam as one of the sort of up and coming country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think the fact that um, uh, we have interest, the right? yeah, yeah. Uh, young population here, the economy has been growing at you know, six, seven percent consistently in the last uh, quarter of the century. Um, and a, a population that is very sort of um, receptive in terms of new technology, uh, I think that has the attention of the global uh, investment circles. Mm -hmm. So I think I agree with you. I think increasingly you'll see a lot of foreign investors actually coming in here to to look for those opportunities as opposed to those companies ha actually have to go out to look for them. Yeah. 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 Just to put it in context, um, last year's funding into Vietnam startup mm. um, 
is three times that of 2017. Yeah. So you know the growth has been you know, you know one of the biggest in Southeast Asia as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're probably second behind Singapore, of course. Yeah. Um, I think you know is this you know sort of a, a perfect storm yeah. of development that is mm. happening in Vietnam. Mm. Mm. That's very promising news, actually. So, with such ambition set for Binca B, uh, mm. did you find many obstacles during the expansion or basically going global? You know, even though the issues facing the agriculture supply chain might be very uh, actually surprisingly similar from one country to another, but they are uh, within different legal contexts. Apart from Vietnam, we focus on uh, English-speaking uh, countries because uh, our headquarters is in London. So those countries actually share the same sort of legal basis as English law. Um, so that there's some kind of com commonality among the markets that basically help to reduce the obstacles. Uh, but uh, you know, really, when you talk about Africa, it's 54 different countries, and they all have uh, different stages of development and different environment. So there are many, many obstacles, not just from the uh, technology point of view, but also from the legal. And uh, of course, when you're trying to bring something new to the market, it's ado adoption from the uh, general population. This company exports Vietnamese peppers, ginger, and spices to many countries using traditional methods. Like other agribusinesses, it has been experiencing extra costs due to over-reliance on U.S. dollar, middlemen, big risks, besides others. We have to do a lot of business for about 3 days. We want to increase the speed of business. The second thing is to find more opportunities to sell products in Vietnam. Those issues are expected to be resolved with a decentralized commodity trading by Binkabi. Here, the platform puts commodities on the blockchain through a process called tokenization. Specific units of commodities such as maize or rice are converted into tokens, which are then traded. By you being able to access to the emerging market, commodity market, then um, you need being copy token. And then when you're having trade, you, you need being copy token in order to receive discount. And this discount are perpetual, that you can use it again and again and again. It is clear that technology and online platforms are giving tremendous global access for startups to consumers and markets, not only in thousands, but in millions. This suggests the government and citizens embrace the revolution because it is happening across the world. Cơ hội này là cơ hội rất đặc biệt. Nó cho phép một doanh nghiệp Việt Nam sẽ có một vị thế rất đặc biệt nếu mà chấp nhận cái cuộc chơi toàn cầu này, chấp nhận cái cạnh tranh trong digital transformation thì sẽ trở thành những công ty hàng đầu thế giới. Held in Da Nang City last December, Tech Fest Vietnam 2018 was with the guiding principle. From here to global. The event attracted partners from around the globe such as Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea with $8 million committed for startups projects. Under the framework of TechFest 2018, Prime Minister Nguyen Xuân Phúc also proposed establishing a national startup center. Now, Vietnam does not rank high in terms of productivity or technology. So does it imply that technology plays a key role for the Vietnamese startups to leverage themselves and directly compete with um, global competitors? Bobby? Um, I think it's all relative term. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, at least if you just look at the Southeast Asia market, you know, in, in terms of technology, uh, Viet Vietnam is actually known <coughs> as a you know, uh, the hub for tech talents. You know, many startups actually come here uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to look for programmers, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and in the past, prior to, you know, this whole, you know, uh, fervor in, in startups uh, all along, I mean, like F FPT, whom you've mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, you know, have done a great job, you know, doing a lot of uh, software outsourcing for, for mm -hmm. international projects. Generally, Vietnamese are quite entrepreneurial. I mean, look at mm. one, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, and, nice. and it's, it's a great combination. And, and this is often spoken amongst a lot of investors um, that basically you need uh, to develop more software architects. Mm -hmm. okay. I think the, um, for me, the key words here is uh, value addition. So mm. 
uh, the trade flow between um, Vietnam, for example, uh, and South Africa is about $1.5 billion a year. But a billion dollars of that is actually um, mobile phones. Right. And when you actually look f uh, closer, then most of that is actually from Samsung. Yeah. And Samsung only uh, do mainly assembly in local markets. So yeah. Yeah. all the sort of equipment and all the parts already been imported. So only tiny, tiny value addition is actually done locally. So I think that that is the issue that Vietnam has to deal with in terms of actually moving up the value chain, actually yeah, adding absolutely. more yeah. sort of value in terms of contents and actually moving away from um, processing or from kind of outsourcing mm -hmm. and actually moving into innovation, innovation yeah. and creating products yeah. that solve problems. Yeah. So it's only the matter of how do you actually adapt um, uh, the, the solution for a specific market, but uh, the, the basic uh, building blocks of the solutions are quite the same, and effectively uh, you're solving similar problems in uh, different markets. Yeah. So yeah. I think um, uh, sitting here in Vietnam, sometimes we feel like um, uh, going global is such a difficult thing, right? Uh, because you know you have different uh, differences in terms of culture and uh, legal systems yeah. and and languages, mm -hmm. for example. But actually, the problems are actually more um, common common yeah. than you think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, especially if you approach approach it from a uh, technology or software kind of based technology point of view. Of course, if you uh, have a brick and mortar business and you actually selling a pork product, yeah. then it might be doing very yeah. well in Singapore, Vietnam, and yeah. China, but not doing so well in sort of Muslim country, right. for example. Yeah. Yeah. So that is where I think uh, what the problem you're trying to solve it actually dictate how easy or how uh, difficult it is for you to go global. Will 2019 open up new opportunities to, uh, for Vietnamese startup to go overseas? Bobby. Tough question. Um, I think the momentum is strong mm -hmm. in terms of connection, network, and yes, the opportunities are definitely there. And I think the opportunities are even better, I would say. I mean, a good example would be VNG, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there, was, there was no need for them to even expand outside and yeah. they're already you know, a certified unicorn. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, for Topica, from education standpoint, again, it's solving a common problem, mm. right? providing you know, uh, sk skills, upskilling um, you know, the uh, emerging market uh, people. Mm. Right? And, and that is a common problem. And I think we have a, a, you know, fairly good solutions for that. And so in terms of scaling in that sense, it's really not that difficult. Mm. Yeah. It seems like we just um, you know, enter a, a new growth uh, yeah. phase in Vietnam. So I think there will be a lot of opportunities here. So for the uh, startup that sort of uh, focusing on um, solving um, a particular issues, I think there's enough opportunities in the local market. Um, I think the looking um, across uh, Southeast Asia, even though it has different um, sort of countries, different languages, uh, different barriers, but actually those are opportunities in themselves sure. um, because of those barriers that you, the, the, the startup that can solve uh, those issues uh, make it difficult for other startups to get in. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. yeah, right. So yeah. because of a high, high barrier to entry. Once again, thank you for our guests. Thank you. And that also wrap up our last edition of BizLine for the Year of the Dog. From our team here at VTV International, enjoy your New Year celebration and don't forget to join us next year for more economic news from Vietnam. In the meantime, do log on to vtv4.vtv.vn or youtube.com slash vtv4go for more of our programs and updates. Thanks for joining us and Happy New Year. Mm -hmm.